Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is titled Musculoskeletal Modeling for the Evolutionary Biologist, a Primer. My name is Christopher Iverson and I work here at Anybody Technology. Today I will be the host of this webinar and I will be joined by my colleague Bjorn Keller Englund, who is one of our research and development engineers here at Anybody Technology. Bjorn will join us during the Q&A session and help us out with answering your questions. In today's webcast, we have an external speaker who is Dr. Adam Sylvester, who is currently working as an associate professor at the Center for Functional Anatomy and Evolution at the Johns Hopkins and University. Adam is going to give his presentation in a minute or so, but just before we start, I will give you a general introduction and overview of the inner body modeling system. For those of you who is unfamiliar with the software or musculoskeletal modeling and simulations in general. So let's begin with having a look at what the Anybody Modeling System actually is. The Anybody Modeling System is a software that allows you to do musculoskeletal modeling and simulations. As input, it takes motion data as kinematics and forces, and it calculates internal body loads as joint moments, joint reaction forces, and muscle forces. And down here in the bottom of the screen, you can see a screenshot from the Anybody Modeling software, which can give you an idea of how the system actually looks. At the moment, anybody is used in a wide variety of areas and applications. And a few examples of this is movement analysis, product optimization design, the field of sports optimization, orthopedics and rehabilitation, and assistive devices as exoskeletons. The typical workflow in anybody could look something like this. So you provide the recorded motion data as input, and then you use the body models which you or others have built. And then you provide some kind of environment, which could be a special type of equipment or, for example, an exoskeleton. Then you can use anybody to combine these things and solve the muscle recruitment and then run the inverse dynamic simulations. This basically means that we go from motion to calculate the internal body loads and the interaction with the environment in some cases. You can then go ahead and output the results and use it for post-processing, which for example, with some kind of finite element tool. But many users also closes this loop completely by, by doing some kind of design optimization and then running this cycle multiple times. This actually brings me to the end of the introduction and I'll try to hand over the presenter role to Adam instead. Okay, all right. Uh, well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Um, Thank you for coming and, and joining the webinar. I'm, I'm really excited to share with you my thoughts and ideas about how evolutionary biologists can leverage this technology, musculoskeletal modeling, for asking questions um, that I think we've been asking for a long time. I'd also like to thank the folks at, at Anybody for inviting me to share this, uh, share this work and make you aware of, of two papers um, the one on the left, which recently appeared in Interface Focus, which is part of the Royal Society Group. Um, and two things about it. One is that it, it really is a, a primer for uh, someone who's new to musculoskeletal modeling and uses human locomotion as an example. And so I'd like to recommend it as, a, as an entry point for people who might be interested in this. Uh, and also point out that this paper is part of a larger special issue at that journal. Uh, called Anthro Engineering, which really looks at this interface between, uh, it's focused on human biology and engineering, but I think really is applicable to anyone who is interested in any sort of biological system. And I'll have the, the citations for these at the end of my talk. I'd like to, I'd like to begin today uh, by giving you a little bit of background about me so you understand where I'm coming from and, and how I've gotten to musculoskeletal modeling in my research. So I am a biological anthropologist by training, and my interests revolve around human and non-human primate locomotion, and what we can understand about human and primate locomotion, really to inform the origins of human or hominin bipedalism. That is, why did our human ancestors, the early, earliest hominids, start walking on two feet? And I, and I find this interesting, this question really compelling and interesting because 
if you look at the things that separate humans from our closest living relative, the chimpanzee, it, it really can come down to two things. You can distill it down to two major things. One, which is that we have really, really large brains. And the second, which is that we, we walk on two feet. And it only takes the most casual review through uh, the fossils that we recognize as being early hominids as in the human lineage to recognize that the, the large brain maybe evolved a couple hundred thousand years ago, but bipedalism evolved several, several million years earlier. And so if we want to understand the origins of humans and the origins of humanity, we have to understand the origins of bipedalism. And I spend a lot of my time thinking about one species in particular, Australopithecus afarensis, because of its antiquity and also because they're relative to a lot of these, these taxa, there are a fair number of fossils with which we can work. Um, and so to give you an idea of, of where we're going today, uh, there are really four things that I want to do, and I want to spend most of my time, if not convincing you, uh, it, at least get you thinking about why you might invest uh, your time and your energy in musculoskeletal modeling. I mean, functional morphologists and evolutionary biologists have been studying morphology for a long time. And, and what is it that I think that is worth your time to invest, you know, investigating your, your energy and your time and learning a, a new methodology uh, to answer questions you've been working on for some time? I'll give you a brief example from paleoanthropology and some research that my colleagues and I have published in, in those papers uh, around the evolution of the human pelvic morphology. There's a couple of questions that have perhaps consumed more paper in, in paleoanthropology than many others. And so I'd, I'd like to talk about those. And then at the end, uh, I don't think that evolutionary biologists need to only be consumers of this technology. I mean, it is the case that the work that has been done by engineers and biomechanists and musculoskeletal modelers up to now have really lowered the barriers for evolutionary biologists to start using this technology. But I think there are important ways that we can help contribute to, to modeling exercises, and I'll talk about those briefly. Uh, and then finally, just some very quick suggestions for the the novice user perhaps if you've never if you've never done any modeling before so to begin one of the major themes within evolutionary biology is to explore these ideas of form function relationships and form function relationship is the idea that the size and the shape of a biological structure is somehow related to what that structure does and so this is a classic picture uh, of the forelimb and a human dog and bird and whale. And you see this in almost every evolutionary biology textbook ever written. And the idea here is that if we, if we can understand the details through detailed analysis of the structure, we can come to learn uh, what that structure does and how that structure functions and even understand why that structure evolved. And I think that we, you know, we apply this thinking, this form function relationship across, you know, all sorts of biological scales from uh, from proteins and molecules through cells to entire limbs uh, or entire organisms. And so it's a really important and pervasive idea within evolutionary biology. And I think there's a, a number of important reasons to to research form function relationships. Um, so in its own right, understanding form function relationships, I think will help us understand the vast diversity uh, of life on the planet, right? There's a, a huge amount of morphological variation that exists both between species, but also within species. And understanding these relationships will help us contextualize that morphological variation that we see within the behavioral and functional diversity that we see. And so, you know, understanding the diversity in function, I think, will help us understand the diversity of life. Understanding form function relationships is another way, I think, that we can explore larger themes within evolutionary biology, not the least of which are adaptation and natural selection. 
I'll make an argument that they're important in phylogenetic reconstructions and identifying traits. Uh, you know, is this trait a, a functional complex and we should treat as a single trait within a character matrix? You know, which traits are more phylogenetically informative? Which ones are perhaps less phylogenetically informative? And so I think form faction relationships can help us elucidate those details uh, in creating in creating phylogenies. And then finally, you know, for those of us, and I include myself in this group, that are have paleontological interests, that our ultimate goal is to, to bring extinct animals back to life, I think understanding these form function relationships are at the base of what we do. That is, if we can, if we can figure out the principles that link the morphology of animals, and not just any one animal, but animals in general, at least vertebrates, to, to their function and their behavior, then I think we have a, a really good chance of making powerful statements and powerful reconstructions of animals that we can, we can no longer observe. I think for vertebrates, it's really hard to overestimate the importance of locomotion and dietary, dietary adaptations in their evolutionary success. And so I'll point out at this point that I think um, much of what I'm going to talk about today in musculoskeletal modeling in general certainly can be applied to dietary systems uh, and the masticatory apparatus. But my goal here would be to talk about locomotion. And as I, you know, locomotion is important because it, it provides animal access to food, water, safety, and potential mates, which means there should be a lot of um, it, a lot of effect on an animal's fitness and um, and its potential for evolutionary success. So I think at this point I, I want to explore um, what I see as some standard methodologies in elucidating these form function relationships and point out potentially a, a limitation. And I I do this you know I'm not picking on anybody else's research, really, I'm going to bring my own to the forefront. Um, it's a, it's, there's a limitation here, and I think the way, at least I see it within in biological anthropology and paleoanthropology, the way these links between form and function have been, have been elucidated or discovered. And so a standard approach, I think, is we start out by measuring morphology. We want to understand something about the shape often of the skeletal material or the musculoskeletal system. And so we quantify things with, with traditional metrics. So these you know, could be caliper measurements or osteometric boards. We might measure the lengths of the bones or the, the dimensions of the joint surfaces. Or we could include things in here like muscle cross-sectional area or types of muscle fibers that are within a single muscle. Uh, people look at cross-sectional properties, so how bone is distributed uh, through the shaft, often of long bones, tell us something about the bending rigidity, maybe reveal something about the behavior. Geometric morphometrics, the statistical analysis of biological shape, you know, this has become really well developed and utilized in the last couple decades, and so we have great understanding of how to quantify biological shape. Uh, using GM techniques. And then most recently, at least in, in my field, are trabecular bone analyses that we hope that the, the trabecular structure within the joints of long bones within vertebrates will reveal something to us, often about that, about that animal's locomotion. And so we try to connect or correlate, uh, you know, morphology with some aspect of locomotion, and that might be something like behavior. And so we rely on uh, field biologists to collect things like locomotor behavior used by the animals or postural behaviors used by the animals out in the, out in the world. Uh, activity budgets, how much time does the animal spend sleeping or eating or in locomotion or in posture? And within locomotion, how much of it is running or walking or climbing trees or hanging below tree branches? You can see my, my primate bias here. Um, or substrate uses. W what are these animals moving along? Are they moving uh, only along the ground? Are they underground? Or we try to correlate it with something that I will loosely refer to as performance. Uh, and so that might, you know, include things like velocity. We can, you know, estimate velocity on the field, but also measure velocity 
in a laboratory study in a setting using um, yeah videography and, and and marker tracking you know and that could be maximum velocity or we might be interested in preferred velocity or comfortable velocity uh, skeletal stress and strain you know, try to correlate with uh, you know are the bones how do they accommodate the stress and strain that is developed during locomotion uh, or of course energy consumption I mean energy is energy consumption metabolic energy consumption is an important aspect of, of locomotion and of course it affects evolutionary fitness uh, directly because any energy that is used in locomotion can't be allocated for uh, for reproduction for investment in offspring and so there should be strong selective pressures and often we use I think performance uh, measure performance as a way to help understand behavior that is we're working under an assumption that or the idea that um, morphologies are adapted to or optimized for behavior and so that they should perform you know, better under that behavior than they might under other behaviors. And so from an analytical approach, uh, you know, approach that I see very frequently in my field um, is either one is, you know, a bivariate plot that looks something like this where we have quantified some aspect of morphology and we put that on the, the x-axis, we treat it as the independent variable and we have some metric on performance and then we plot our data points out there. Uh, I in my life have never had so many data points on my plots, but maybe you have. And then you know we run a, a correlation analysis and we find out that we have a good correlation, whatever that might, you know, might mean for your field. And we get a p-value out of it, and we find out that the p-value is extra small. So that's always exciting. Uh, that's a publishable result. And we draw a regression line. And that regression line tells us something. It's a description of the relationship between the morphology and the performance. Or, uh, or another one, and uh, you know, I'll give you an example from uh, some work I did a few years ago, which was a a geometric morphometric analysis of the distal femur. So I'm interested in in the knee joint uh, in human and hominid locomotion. And so I carried out a landmark analysis with about a thousand landmarks. And if you read a lot of the GM literature, you'll see lots of, of plots like this where we look at the descriptors of shape. And in my analysis, we end up plotting uh, humans and gorillas and chimpanzees. And it, it this plot uh, each point represents an entire shape. So each point is a unique shape of a distal femur. And this result tells us, you know, something that I think we already know, which is that humans and chimpanzees and gorillas have knees that are shaped differently. And so it's easy to, you know, uh, provide a reason for that. Of course, on the right side, humans, well, they're bipedal, so that's why their knee is shaped the way it is. And on the left side, we have chimpanzees and gorillas. And you know, they're quadrupedal, and so that's why their knees are shaped the way they are. And usually there's some separation between, between chimpanzees and gorillas. And we can describe that or ascribe that to, to any number of things. You know, it could be maybe it's body size. We always have to consider body size. Or maybe it's that chimpanzees are more arboreal than, than the gorillas. Um, or maybe it's simply drift, and, and we don't really understand what's going on. But, but I argue in one thing that I haven't really learned more than I already knew, which is that these animals utilize different behaviors and uh, that their, their knees are shaped differently. But I was also using this as a way to try to understand or contextualize fossil hominins, so early fossil hominins. And, you know, much to my dismay or, um, is that they would plot in either one of two places. One is they would plot right between humans on the one hand and the non-human apes on the other hand. And so what does this mean in terms of interpretation of their of their morphology? You know, if we know we know that humans are bipeds and that chimps and gorillas are quadrupeds, but no one's gonna make a realistic argument that they are the interpolated triped in between. Um, nor should we should we think that they that their morphology is somehow functionally intermediate. I mean, what would it mean to be have a knee that's functionally intermediate between a human bipedal knee 
and a chimpanzee or a gorilla quadrupedal maybe. Or worse, um, was that some fossils plotted outside of the range of extant mate variation. And you know, then we have to extrapolate. And really what, we, what we're potentially seeing is, is some form of locomotion that we fundamentally don't understand. There's something about the knee function in these fossils that has nothing to do, and that interpolating their morphology really does not uh, interpolate their behavior. And I, you know, and I'm going to say something that's quite trite, and every scientist, no doubt, has has heard this. Um, but in, in doing this, what we have found, of course, is just a description of a relationship. We have found a correlation, and and not a causation. And so I think that leads us to a place um, that I often rely upon, which is in functional morphology, in evolutionary biology, what kind of questions are we asking? What kind of questions do we want to answer? And I rely um, perhaps on a very poor analogy from physics, but it's one that I can quickly get my, my head wrapped around, which is, um, which is gravity, understanding gravity, what kind of questions that, that physicists ask. And if you, if you want to understand if you want to describe gravity, if you want to describe the magnitude of the force between objects, then all you need is Newton's universal law of gravitation, which says that the force um, is related to the mass of the two objects and the square of the distance between them. And that will provide you a description of the way gravity behaves. But that's not what gravity is, right? As I understand it, gravity is the idea that space time is curved around masses especially in the presence of large masses and so i have you know to ask ourselves as evolutionary biologists do we want do we want to answer you know this kind of question where we just have a description of reality where we're satisfied with correlations we're satisfied with regressions that describe relationships we're satisfied with morphological clusters that seem to correlate with behavioral groups or do we want to understand why these things exist? And and I would argue, and I and I hope most people agree that we really do want to understand the why, the hows. How is morphology related to function, and why do these things evolve? So how do we connect? How do we create a, a closer connection between morphology, between form and function, especially in locomotor research, when we go out and we measure morphology on the one hand, and we measure some aspect of locomotion, whether it's behavior or performance in the other. I think the good news is, is that um, I think we have a reasonable expectation of what variables are going to provide that link between morphology and, and locomotion. And I would argue that the ones that we need to know are the internal forces. And so these are the bone, bone to bone contact forces uh, and, and the muscle forces. And so I think that's the good news. The good news is we, we know what we're looking for. And I think you know these are these are reasonable things to expect because muscle forces generate locomotion. It's the contraction of muscles and the generation of force by muscles that propel the body through through space, that propel animals' um, bodies across uh, across the earth and, and, and through the water. Uh, it's, it's muscles that consume energy. Now that, that relationship between metabolic energy consumption and muscle force may be complex, but if we want to understand it, then we have to understand what the muscle forces are. And if we think that understanding the patterns and magnitude of skeletal stress and skeletal strain, then we have to understand the internal forces of the body, the forces that those skeletal elements are actually being subjected to. So that's the good news that we, you know, that we know, we know what it is we're looking for. We know what variables we want. The bad news is um, those internal forces are exceptionally difficult, if not impossible to measure in an experimental setting. You can do it for a few number of joints or maybe a few number of muscles. Um, you know, in a, in a very compliant animal, in a very controlled laboratory setting. Um, yeah, for just a, you know, via surgical intervention, surgical implantation of those, of sensors into the body, 
And so if your interests are, say, forces inside of the hip in humans who have undergone a hip replacement surgery with a prosthetic hip, then you're in luck because you can just measure the forces in that population of people. Uh, humans in general are compliant. But if you're interested in chimpanzees or you're interested in gorillas or you're interested in any number of other charismatic uh, animals on the planet and you want to know these things, you're not going to be able to, uh, to measure them experimentally. And so I think um, the path forward, the way that we can make progress here is through musculoskeletal modeling. Musculoskeletal modeling is the, is the technology, is the preeminent technique that can provide us these pieces of internal information that we need in order to make that connection between morphology and function, morphology and performance, and uh, morphology and behavior. And so just to brief, I don't want to you know, rehash the, uh, the opening part of the, the intro, but musculoskeletal modeling extends what biologists have been doing for a long time, which is inverse dynamic models. And they extend them, in, I think, in two important ways. One is that it includes models of individual muscles, and it solves the muscle redundancy problem. And so inverse dynamic models can resolve um, you know, measuring accelerations of, of limb segments and measuring external forces like ground reaction force. You can resolve these models down to joint reaction forces and joint moments. But musculoskeletal modeling will take it that extra step. And by using models of individual muscles and solving what I'm going to talk about in a second, which is the muscle redundancy problem, we can get bone to bone contact forces as well as forces within individual muscles. So I do want to talk about the muscle redundancy problem a little bit because this one has you know, been solved um, in the literature for individual joints or for individual problems um, based on some, you know, I think less than optimal assumptions. But this is a picture that probably appears in every biomechanics text ever written, uh, some version of this or every, uh, you know, even physics textbook. And the students are asked, you know, given the mass of the arm, and the mass of a weight that the hand is holding to calculate some uh, force being generated to the muscle to hold that position, to hold the arm stationary, to create a, a, muscle, um, a muscle flexion moment to, to counteract the extension moments that are being generated by the mass of the arm and being generated by the, the mass of the weight in the hand. And this is a perfectly good exercise uh, for, for students to figure out. Um, the problem is that I think it, it's asking the wrong question, which is in a real human, it is not one muscle that is generating this, this force, that are generating force to cause the flexion moment. You know, there are at least three muscles. We would, we would wanna know what the force of the biceps brachii is and the force of the brachioradialis and the force of the muscle called brachialis because they all can contribute to a flexion moment at the elbow. And we have to have a decision about how to allocate the net moment to each of these muscles. And musculoskeletal modeling solves that problem. You know, under a minimization criterion, we can solve how much force we should allocate to biceps brachii, brachioradialis, and brachialis. And in a larger context, um, throughout the entire through the, the entire body. And you know, what my group is interested in is is through the lower lower limbs during locomotion. And so in, in that way, we can get those pieces of information, that muscle force and the bone-to-bone -bone contact force that we need to make, to make progress in connecting morphology uh, with function, with, with performance, and with behavior. I'd like to you know, switch now to a, an example from paleoanthropology. Um, and one of the most uh, investigated skeletal feature in, in human evolution is the evolution of the human pelvis, and specifically the evolution of what's called the hip abductor mechanism. And so this is the mechanism for gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. 
These are hip abductors, uh, and they are critically important during bipedal, during human bipedal locomotion, both walking and running, because during the uh, during the single support phase, during the, the time during walking and running when only one foot is in contact with the ground, the pelvis has a tendency to collapse or tilt. And these muscles are active to stabilize the pelvis and stabilize, stabilize the trunk. And there are you know, two questions that really have occupied a lot, of, uh, a lot of time within biological anthropology. One is looking at the difference in the shape of the pelvis between early hominins, uh, like Australopithecus afarensis, the very famous Lucy fossil, and the shape of the pelvis in modern humans in the context of the hip abductor mechanism. And one thing that you know all researchers involved agree on is that the iliac blades, which uh, provide the, the origin for these muscles, are much more laterally flaring and coronally oriented in Australopithecus afarensis than they are in modern humans. And so the question is, what does that mean? And various researchers have argued uh, that it could mean that uh, their bipedalism was um, was essentially modern, entirely modern, uh, and that it doesn't really betray a, a functional difference. Uh, others have argued that it, it indicates that they were energetically less efficient, like in a metabolic sense of the word, or that their bipedalism would have required significant hip flexion or knee flexion during, uh, during walking behaviors, or that during walking, uh, Australopithecines would have required a large amount of lateral sway to their trunk. They would have had to lean over side to side during walking. And so we all agree on the morphology, but we, we don't have an agreement on what this on what this morphology means. And people have been arguing about this for almost 50 years. The other question that has occupied uh, a lot of time within paleoanthropology is, is understanding the shape of the modern human pelvis, especially as it's uh, seen as a compromise between two com competing demands. And so the, the argument goes um, that on the one hand, uh, the pelvis, the modern human pelvis is a reflection of our locomotion. And then the other is the demand for obstetrics, for childbirth. And that the human pelvis is a compromise between these two, these two competing demands because locomotion should favor a narrow pelvis. A narrow pelvis will make the hip abductor mechanisms more efficient or structurally more sound. Um, and either one of those things should increase the fitness of individuals um, and should be selected for. Whereas obstetrics should favor a wide pelvis and specifically the distance between the hip joints, between the acetabulum, because they in part dictate the birth canal and a wider birth canal will be safer for the neonate, safer for the mother, and so a wider pelvis will reduce infant mortality and reduce uh, uh, maternal mortality. And so that the human pelvis is, is a compromise between these two these two morphologies. And without going, you know, too much of a detailed analysis, the one thing that both of these questions have in common, as they have been posed and investigated, is that researchers have uh, focused on the point in the gait cycle called mid-stance. And they have used this as uh, the moment for all comparisons and all analyses for the hip abductor mechanism. And uh, in one of our first investigation, my colleagues and I uh, tracked how much force each of the muscles are generating uh, during all of these major phases of the human gait cycle. And what we actually found is that the hip abductors generate the largest amount of force during what's called the braking phase, so early in, uh, in the gait cycle. And so this fundamental assumption or uh, simplification of human bipedal walking to focus on mid-stance really probably isn't the right time in the, uh, in the stance phase to look, or at very least, we should be looking at other phases in uh, during stance phase to get a better idea of how these hip abductors are actually functioning.
the other thing that we that we noticed, and, and not that we were terribly surprised by this, but that the force generated by these muscles fluctuates across stance phase. And as I said earlier, it's you know problematic, complex, complicated to equate muscle force with metabolic energy consumption. But it's it's perhaps not unreasonable to expect that there is some relationship between how much force a muscle is generating and how much metabolic energy it is consuming. And so uh, in looking at this, we can see, we can have an expectation that the metabolic energy required by these muscles also fluctuates across the stance phase, which means that focusing on any one point in the gait cycle, only looking at mid stance or even only looking at the braking phase is not gonna give us a complete picture uh, of how this muscle is working and when it might have the most metabolic effect uh, on, on overall energy consumption during walking. And so it, instead of continuing to, to investigate this with, with techniques that probably are not going to give us the answer, um, you know, looking using musculoskeletal model reveal these patterns that we can't get with measuring oxygen consumption. Um, or static, uh, static analyses at one point in the gait cycle. As I finish up today, I wanna just make two points. Um, one, which is that I think evolutionary biologists really have a, a contribution to make here. We don't only have to be consumers. I think, you know, lucky for us, a lot of the barriers have been lowered. Um, the, the creation of the modeling environment, the software, the physics that are already programmed into the system, um, you know, generic models for how muscles function, the, the algorithms that determine how to allocate force among potential muscles, that's already, already in the system and we can leverage that to our own questions and to our own advantage. But musculoskeletal modeling really is situated at this interface between biological variation and, and classical mechanics. And you know, understanding and appreciation of, of biological variation really is a core competency of evolutionary biologists, and I'll say, you know, biological anthropologists. And so I think we have some things to offer for, um, for contributing to, to musculoskeletal modeling, not the least of, you know, an appreciation of skeletal variation. Certainly within my field, we think that skeletal variation across the human lineage tells us something about their function. And so uh, we can integrate what we understand about that skeletal variation into musculoskeletal models. Muscle variation. Uh, some of the muscle models require a huge number of, of, of parameters. And, you know, I know within biological anthropology, within primates, there are a large number of people who are collecting these data. Uh, that can be integrated into musculoskeletal models of non-human primates. And, and finally, the other is, is models of other animals. I mean, certainly developing a model from, from scratch is a, is a huge undertaking and it would you know, benefit from a large community of users to, uh, to work together to build a model for, for complex animals that may not, may not already exist. I mean, certainly the human models are well-developed and there are some some other models for some other organisms out there, but but not many. And so I think that's a way that, that we can really contribute and help move this, this field along. And then just so, some final thoughts for the novice user, if you've never um, never thought about musculoskeletal modeling or you know just thinking about it. One is I can't uh, overemphasize that it is more accessible than it's ever been. Uh, I started probably playing around with musculoskeletal modeling four or five years ago and was sort of was touch and go. Um, but really, it is much, much easier and the barriers have been lowered significantly for um, for use. And so I think it's, it's a good time. You know, we're just at that that moment where we can really start leveraging um, leveraging this for our research. And then two things to keep in mind. One is that, of course, is that models are abstractions of reality. You know, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And knowing the abstraction that your models uh, have in them, the assumptions that they're making, is important in any modeling exercise. So 
the model that we use for our research is a, you know, I would say generic off the shelf model. And in it, the knee has one degree of freedom, which for our purposes of understanding muscle forces during walking is perfectly reasonable. But if you're interested in what's happening inside the knee with the menisci and the ligaments, then perhaps you need a more, a more complex model. And so be aware that there are abstractions that may not suit your purpose. And that the other one is that there are many choices. There are a lot of choices in modeling. And you have to be aware of what all those choices are. And there are too many you know, to go in through here. And I, again, maybe direct you uh, as an entry point to our, our paper and, um, and the interface focus to just some of, the, some of the choices that you would have to make in modeling. And even if you take a model that's ready built off the shelf, you can choose to, to change some of the parameters of the model, and that's a choice. Or you can choose to leave the model as it is and use the parameters that are, that are already in the model, but that's also a choice. And so you have to be really intentional in the choices you make to change things, but also the choices that you make to leave things as they are. And so really the responsibility uh, of making those choices and the information that you'll get from them uh, is, is on you to understand. At this point, I'd, I'd like to thank my two collaborators, Patricia Kramer at the University of Anthropology, I mean, sorry, the Department of Anthropology at the University of Washington, and Stephen Lautzenheiser at the, in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Tennessee. This, uh, the work that I presented and the papers that I showed at the beginning are really a collaborative effort and would not have been possible without the, uh, the two of them. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening, and in case you're interested, these are the, the references to the two papers we published earlier this year. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think it was uh, it's very interesting, and uh, we're also getting a lot of messages from attendees who think there's a lot of great information. So, so thank you for doing this and taking the time. Great. Yeah, so just before we go to the Q&A session, I would just like to say a few words regarding our online resources and how to, to find out more about anybody's technology. So first of all, you can go and check out our website, uh, anybodytech.com. And here you can find different information as events as this webcast here or other special dates. But there is also a full publication list of studies using the Anybody modeling system. And this list now exceeds 830 papers. So, so there's a lot of information and inspiration to go and, go and look up there. You can also go and check out our website, anyscript.org, which is our community website for people using anybody. And here you will find multiple online resources as our wiki page, several blog posts and links to our repository sites. And it's also here our forum is located. So you can go and ask some questions and get help from fellow anybody users. I would also like to point your attention to an upcoming event we have here on October 26th. And this event is named Future of Workwear. And we have Professor John Rasmussen from Aalborg University here in Denmark. And he will do a presentation on simulation-based conceptual exoskeleton design. So if you are interested in this area, you should definitely go and check this out. And last but not least, if you have any questions or you want to meet up or you are interested in receiving a trial version of the Anybody Modeling software, then please feel free to send us an email at sales at anybodytech.com. And if you have any follow-up question regarding this webcast or any of our previous ones, then please feel free to send me an email at ki at anybodytech.com or reach out to me through LinkedIn. <laughs>